Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. We're here in the middle of September, which is kind of hard to believe. I'm Brian Manning. I'm a financial advisor here in Nashville for Pinnacle Financial Partners. And thankfully, I'm joined by Lane Rhodes, our resident SBA and specifically PPP uh, expert. And we are here today to hopefully answer your questions. Um, the, the focus of this event today is to do a Q&A um, to let you ask us questions about the forgiveness process. Um, again, we are going to have lots of participants today, and so we will do our best to answer questions in, in generalities and groups. Um, please use the Q&A function. Um, there's both a Q&A and a chat function. We'll be monitoring the Q&A function, so if you'll just submit your question that way, we'll review it and uh, try to address it at some point during the webinar today. Um, understand that we likely won't be able to specifically address your particular business. If you've got a real specific question regarding your business and your situation, it's probably best handled offline, maybe with your CPA or your financial advisor here at Pinnacle. But uh, we'll do our best to walk through the Pinnacle system, to walk through the overall process and try to answer the questions that you all have about the general process. Uh, I guess with that, Lane, good morning and thanks for spending some time with us today. How are you? I'm doing great, Brian. It's good to see you. Always great to see you. Uh, I guess we'll just jump right in, Lane, and let you talk about maybe any changes. It's been a few weeks since we've done a webinar. Um, and just give us an update of where the process is with the forgiveness applications and, and any changes that we think is probably a good place to start today. Yeah, no, I think that is a great place to start. Um, PPP does continue on. We have not received any guidance from Congress as far as any additional funds of maybe being able to open up loan applications again for those that may need a second round or didn't get in on the first round. Um, the forgiveness process has been slow is probably the best way to put it. SBA has been hesitant to process any of the applications that the banks have actually submitted to them for forgiveness. And so they have received, um, you know, lots and lots, probably, you know, over 100,000 applications now are over to the SBA and they have not looked at a single one of them. I know from a pinnacle standpoint, we've probably sent them about four to 500 at this point um, that we've actually gotten in here. But I just want to reiterate, Brian, there just isn't really a big rush unless your business has some change of ownership or some underlying reason as to why they want to apply for forgiveness. There's just no rush at this point to kind of get your application in. Um, uh, another thing that I like to remind people of is if you haven't used all the money, you have, you know, now to the end of the year to be able to use those funds. And so there's also no rush. Um, on your money at this point. So I know some people were under the assumption if they had their eight weeks that they had to use it all and apply for forgiveness shortly after that eight weeks was up. Um, and that's just not the case. And so if you still have money left, you still have time to use it. And then for those that have used all of their funds, there's just no rush at this point to submitted. Um, you know, Brian Goldman Sachs did do a survey of about a thousand business owners a few weeks ago. And from their survey, 88% of those businesses had already exhausted all of their PPP money. So that's a pretty, you know, I think good sign that the majority of the, the businesses out there have already utilized all of their PPP funds. But I think another important number that Goldman Sachs kind of looked at when they were polling some of these business owners is about 25% of those business owners said that if the government didn't open up another round of PPP, they were going to be um, at risk of having to shut their business down. And so, you know, we know that things are difficult out there and that there may be some, some business owners that desperately need another round. Um, we don't have the capabilities right now to do that, but I am getting those phone calls on a weekly basis right now of people saying, you know, what other resources does the government have? And so the EIDL program is still open with the government and they're processing those. It is slow as well, so it's not going to be really quick money that comes in, but that is another government, you know, option that is available out there. 
Lane, I think one of the conversations that I know I've had a lot with clients in the last few weeks is the application for forgiveness process has kind of opened up is to your point, there felt like some urgency with a lot of people to, to go ahead and do that. And maybe that's personal preference or maybe that's some information that they've read a few different places. Would you mind just reminding our participants of what are the guidelines? What is their timeline to begin the forgiveness process, whether they chose the eight week or 24 week period and, and how they can go about doing that? Yeah, so technically they have um, a, a, a really long time right now. So it is it is a rolling kind of calendar of how SBA is looking at it. So it's essentially like 10 months after you exhaust your funds to have to come back and apply for forgiveness. So you can't wait forever, um, but you do have a really long runway of applying for forgiveness. So once you exhaust your funds, whether you use, you know, the eight weeks or you're using a 24 week period, you still have months after you exhaust those funds to come back and apply for forgiveness. And there's no fear in the forgiveness process that the government's going to run out of money like we had with the application process. So I've heard that as well from individuals saying, oh, well, I just want to get it in because I'm really scared the money's going to run out. Um, the money is there. When you've got your PPP loan, that reserved that money for you. So there's no risk that you need to get your application in to us as soon as possible or the forgiveness funds can run out. Now, Brian, some of the timelines that I want to remind people of is once the bank gets your forgiveness application, the bank has 60 days to process that application and send it over to SBA. Once SBA gets it, SBA has 90 days to process those and give their ruling on forgiveness. And right now they're telling us they're going to take the full 90 days. So that's a really long runway that you have to be able to know that your money is going to be forgiven. So just because you send us over an application for forgiveness doesn't mean you're off the hook. The money's automatically going to be forgiven. There's still some steps that we have to go through. Um, and it's just as far as our process here internally at Pinnacle. Um, so the client's going to complete that process in the numerated application that we emailed over to them for forgiveness. We are going to send you an email once we get that forgiveness application, letting you know that the file was complete and we've sent it on to SBA. Or you're going to get an email from us asking for additional documentation. That 60 day timeline that the bank has includes that back and forth when we go back to the client and ask them for information. So it's going to be imperative that if we ask you for something that wasn't in the file, um, that doesn't allow us to move your application onto SBA, you need to respond quickly because if that 60 day window runs out, we run the risk at that point of it having to tell the SBA that was a declined application. We don't know 100% for sure how SBA is going to look at those, but we just are trying to err on the safe side. Um, so it's going to be important that the clients get that information back to us because we don't know what happens at the end of that 60 day window with SBA. They may tell us at that point we cannot submit the application over to them. So it's important that the file is complete. And the main reason that we're seeing that files are not complete, Brian, when they come back into us is they number one reason they haven't completed the workbook that we gave them, the spreadsheet that includes calculating their payroll cost. That's the number one reason that calculator form that we have. And just to, you know, remind people Pinnacle put out a calculator, and then if you use a third-party payroll processor, they more than likely have a PPP calculator that's built into your payroll software. That calculator can also be used, so you don't have to recreate the wheel by doing the Pinnacle form. You're more than welcome to use your third-party payrolls provider form and just attach that, email that to us with the Pinnacle form. And on the Pinnacle calculator, Brian, I'm just telling people to complete those non-payroll related items. So they can complete, you know, use their third party payroll reports to give us the payroll component of that calculator form and then input the non payroll related expenses into the pinnacle calculator and send both those documents to us. And then you must also provide us the supporting payroll documents. So whether that's um, 
your pay stubs or your 940s, that information needs to come over with those files for the records to be complete and for us to be able to fully process that within the 60 day time window that we have to get that over to SBA. And then once it gets to SBA, it's anybody's guess as to how quickly those are going to be processed. They you know, technically have 90 days and right now they're saying they're going to take 90 days and they might even take longer depending on any changes. I think they were honestly hoping, um, Brian, that this blanket forgiveness was going to be passed and it didn't get passed this week. Um, and now the, you know, the confidence in Congress getting something done before the election has really dropped to below 50-50 at this point. So I think we probably need to give up hope on that blanket forgiveness just for right now until we get through the election. Yeah, I think that's probably great advice, Lane. I know one of the conversations I've had um, with several clients as they're putting their documents together for forgiveness is they had money that that did spill over into the third quarter. And so they're wondering, do they need to wait until they've got all their tax documents for the third quarter complete? My advice has been yes. But again, I think that gets back into the conversation about this urgency to begin the forgiveness process. But really, what's most important is that they have all of their documents together and complete so that they can submit a full and complete application. Because I think that's been the biggest issue on our side is as people have been submitting their applications to us for forgiveness, they've not had a complete application or they've not had all of their documentation. And there's really not a lot we can do at the application at that point. That's right, Brian. It's got to be complete for us to be able to process it. So um, there's no urgency. So I would wait till you have all the correct tax documentation. Um, we feel from a due diligence standpoint that since this is a taxpayer funded benefit that small businesses are getting, it's going to be important to prove that you paid your proper payroll reported taxes as part of this verification process. And the only way that we can truly validate that is by, you know, one, getting those 940. So if you had some of the PPP money roll into the third quarter, um, you would really need to wait until end of third quarter when you file those quarterly payroll documents to come back and apply for forgiveness. Yeah, I think that's great advice. It's probably a good time to um, to remind everyone that our website that has all of this information available is www.pnfp.com slash PPP forgiveness. Uh, we walk you through the process there. We've got a list of the necessary documents. We've, the calculator is available. And the other thing that we've done, if you go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash watch PNFP, um, Lane and I walked through the application process about a month ago. And you can go and you can watch as we walk through the application process and complete the calculator and see how that information feeds from the calculator that we send you uh, into the actual enumerated uh, application process. So you can go check both of those resources out as you begin to, to start your process for forgiveness. So again, we would direct you to pnfp.com slash PPP forgiveness. And also on YouTube, if you just search watch PNFP, um, that has a full library of, of webinars on the PPP program, the forgiveness process, and actually walking you through the application. So we'll do that. Um, Lane, maybe it'd be a good time. I know one of the documents we've got out on the PPP forgiveness site at PNFP.com is a list of the necessary documents that each entity type needs to have available. Um, do you mind walking through a couple of those um, documents that we know are really necessary for, for our clients to have together when they submit their application to us? Yeah, no, Brian, that's a great point to bring up. We have some wonderful resources checklists um, out there to help clients maneuver through this process. And so since we know the number one reason that we're rejecting an application for forgiveness and sending it back to the client is not having the information that we need to process it, I think those checklists are really important for people to go back and look at. And it's actually built in as part of our calculator as well. Um, and so, you know, if you're a sole proprietor or a 1099 contractor, your application is going to be really easy. So we just need um, basically proof that you paid yourself over whatever period you wanted to use, whether it was the eight week or the 24 week window, um, just proof of payroll um, that you used your PPP money and then the supporting payroll document to go with it. And then any of the third party um, 
reports that that you can give to us are helpful as well. Um, if you use a third party payroll, even for you know yourself individually, that would be beneficial to provide with that. Once we get down to you know corporations, S corps, C corps, partnerships, they're going to need to provide full payroll documents. Um, and one of the things that we need to remind people of Brian is whatever payroll information they provide back to us, whether that's their 940s, the 941s, or a third party report from their payroll provider, it's going to be important that they back out any salaries that were in excess of 100,000. And so that is one of the things we've seen when we get some of these reports back over to us. It might be the right report, but that report didn't take that extra little step of removing the payroll that was over 100,000. So that is another step. If you use a third party payroll provider, those third parties usually um, have reports already put together that do that step for you. Um, so it's important that you have that information put together. And then when we go over to the non payroll related expenses, it's going to be equally as important that you give us good documentation for that. So if you're going to be submitting documents for lease payments that you made, we need a copy of your original lease. We have to prove that that lease was in place as of February 15th of this year. And then we, we need to see where you actually paid the landlord that lease payment. We know a lot of these payments are done through ACH draft and maybe not a physical check that's written. So you need to give us proof that that's been drafted from your account and sent over to your landlord in order for us to be able to count that towards your forgiveness numbers. Same thing for utilities. We're going to need to get a utility bill that shows that utility was in place as of February 15th of this year. And then whatever month statements that you wanted to include in your PPP forgiveness. So say you're using May and June month we need a copy of your May statement, a copy of your June statement, and then we need to partner that up with how you paid for that item. So if you wrote a check, if you did ACH draft, we need some sort of copy with that statement so that we know exactly um, that utility expense to be able to include it in the forgiveness numbers. Um, so those are some important reminders there just on the documentation that we're going to need to be able to validate those non payroll related expenses. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, we've got some questions from our participants now, so we'll jump into that. Uh, looks like the first one we have is from Amy and she's asking about using a third party payroll administrator. And her question is, can I use the payroll ports for documentation rather than listing all of my employees individually? in the payroll cost aggregator tab of our Excel worksheet. And I think Lane, our response to that is absolutely. If your payroll um, administrator <laughs> provides that for you, we don't need you to do double work. Um, so, so how would you advise if people have, do use a third party payroll processor, what's the best approach as they use the combination of those documents and our uh, Excel spreadsheet? Yes, Brian, we definitely don't want clients to have to recreate the wheel if somebody's already done it for them. So um, ADP, Paychecks, even QuickBooks, all of those softwares have their own paycheck protection calculator available. And if you can print all of that data off, not just the first page, so that has been, you know, some of the things we've seen when we've gotten these reports back into us. They may have used a third party's calculator, but they didn't give us all of the information that we need from that calculator. So it's going to be important that they provide that whole entire file to us. But most definitely, they can send us that instead of inputting all of that information into the pinnacle calculator um, for forgiveness. I, I do still like for people to fill out our calculator if they also have non payroll related expenses that they want to include in there. Um, but they don't need to, they can skip past the tab that's for payroll and use the third parties reports for that tab and then just complete the tab that's for the non payroll related expenses. I think that's helpful. So Daniel has a question, um, really about the use of funds. His question is asking about the difference in the variance of the periods and uh, he asked about specifically the eight week period and can you choose when you begin your eight week period? So, Lane, what's your best guidance for how people do that calculation? Yes, so you can't pick which weeks you want for your eight week. If you use the eight week, that would have been somebody that applied for the PPP loans prior to the end of July. 
and your eight weeks started on the day you got your PPP funds deposited into your bank account or you received a check from the bank. Um, so that would be your eight week window. If you want to use anything other than that eight week window, you automatically go to the 24 week time period and the 24 week time period um, would expire at the end of this year. Um, and you have it's kind of it's kind of fuzzy here, Brian, but I think where a lot of people are going with this is the certifications that you're making when you come back to the bank to ask for forgiveness. You do have to certify them out through that full 24 weeks, even if you use the funds in 13 weeks or 14 weeks. But your window always starts on the day you receive the money. So your clock starts whether you pick the eight week or the 24 week your window starts on the on the day you receive that money from the bank. You can't pick and choose when your payroll window starts. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And that kind of goes into the next question that we have from Eric. He's talking about using the funds over the 24 week period. And, and I guess it's good to reiterate your point about as a part of that, even if you utilize the funds over a 13 or 14 week period, if you choose the 24 week period, part of what you're certifying is that you're maintaining your salary levels through the entire 24 week period. Is that how you understand it right now? Yes, Brian, that's how we understand it today. We are hopeful that SBA will give us a little bit more guidance on that because Honestly, that is a question we have. So um, we're, we're hopeful. But as it stands right now and the way those forms read, when you certify those, even if you use the money, say in 14 weeks, you come back to the bank in week 15 and apply for forgiveness, you're certifying through the end of the 24 weeks that you kept your, your head count and the salaries um, at the consistent level that you didn't you know, drop below 20% um, or more there in either one of those categories. I think that's helpful. Um, Kathy's question is about actually making loan payments. So Kathy was asking about once the application has been submitted, is that when she begins to make her loan payments? And and actually, unless she knows, I guess, that, that she's not going to get forgiveness, it really is waiting to determine if her if her loan is is approved for forgiveness and if not maybe then a portion of that may have to be repaid and that's when the payments begin is that right lane yeah so the ppp flexibility act that was passed um, in late july really helped with this and what that allows is so you know like kathy said there's going to be a window of time when she applies to the bank we review those documents, then SBA reviews it, then they get back to us on what's forgivable and what's not. Um, during that window of time, no payments have to be made. And the SBA has said as much that regardless of how long that window takes, the SBA is deferring payments during that period until they make their decision and they actually pay the bank the money. So once the money comes into the bank to forgive the loan or forgive a portion of the loan, once that is done, then the bank will come back to you, Kathy, and say, okay, now you have a balance just to use round numbers of 20,000 left on your PPP loan that you would have to pay back that wasn't forgiven. Then they would go back and amateurize that over five years and your payments would start the following month on that. But no payments have to be made until SBA has made their decision and given that decision to the bank and to you as the client. So that that was a really nice change that happened as part of that flexibility act that was passed. I think that's helpful. Karen's question is about accelerated bonuses. Um, Karen asked, we were originally advised to use accelerated bonuses to help with use of funds within the eight week period. Now, she says it's a bit unclear as to whether bonuses dispersed within the spend window will be counted for forgivable payroll spend. Uh, Lane, can you give us an update on what you understand the guidance to be right now? So I think the key word that she's using there that's causing some problems for her is an accelerated bonus. So payroll use for PPP funds that will be forgiven has to be payroll that was earned during that 
PPP forgiveness window. So if you use the term accelerated to mean you're going to pay out bonuses that were not earned during that payroll period, those bonuses could not be included in your PPP numbers. Now, that's not to say what SBA has said that you can definitely pay people a bonus and that's eligible for your PPP funds. A lot of people are causing calling this um, you know, hazard pay for some employees, you know, we, they um, may have to be working overtime right now because some staff can't come into work because of a COVID related issue and other people are picking up that slack and working longer hours. By all means, you can pay those individuals a bonus um, and that bonus was earned on payroll dollars that were earned during your forgiveness window. But if you're using the term accelerated to mean that you used your payroll money through the end of June, but you know you're going to have people that earn bonuses, say, in October and November of this year, well, let's go ahead and pay them out those bonuses with our payroll numbers from June that would not be eligible because those are payroll dollars that were earned outside of your PPP forgiveness window. I think that's helpful. A um, couple of questions here regarding documentation. Um, so we'll kind of lump those all into one and it kind of goes back to what we talked about previously, but Nancy's asking specifically with respect to 941s and the quarterly tax documents that are necessary, how far back do our clients need to go in gathering that information? Do we need to have them going all the way back into 2019 just to support the consistency in the payroll or what information is necessary on the forgiveness application? So on the forgiveness application, you're going to you know, certify to us that your payroll numbers are in line with whatever that look back period was that you picked when we originally validated your numbers on the front end. We shouldn't need to go back in any of that historical information unless you get an email from somebody here at Pinnacle that we have questions about that and there was some issue, maybe we didn't collect the proper documentation um, that was used to calculate your original PPP amount. So on the forgiveness, you should only need to provide us payroll records that provide us documentation that cover that payroll period of your forgiveness window. Now, to the point of we're in the middle of third quarter right now, if somebody exhausts their money this week, they're not going to have a 940 to submit to us for that this payroll period until the end of third quarter. So you would want to wait until, you know, you get through third quarter, you have a 940 fully completed for third quarter, and you can adequately show us that you've paid those proper payroll taxes to the federal government on the money that you used for your PPP loan. So that is kind of, you know, a vague answer there, Brian, I think of exactly what's needed because it's going to depend on if you used your money in this quarter or last quarter, if you used it all during second quarter and you've got your 940s and you're ready to go and submit, then you're welcome to go ahead and get that information into us now. But if you had a payroll period that rolled into another quarter, so maybe you're spanning second and third quarter, which is very likely, and that's a lot of the candidates we have right now that are trying to apply for forgiveness. And our best advice to them is if they do have a few weeks that rolled over into third quarter, it would be best to wait until they have all of their payroll documents fully baked from the end of this quarter to send over to us. Um, otherwise, it's going to be quite a paper trail. We're probably going to have to come back to them to collect to show that they adequately paid all of their payroll taxes um, for those funds spent in third quarter that they wouldn't have all of their 940 information for at this time. Yeah, and probably a great opportunity to stress um, that once they submit their forgiveness application that they do need to be aware and, and pay attention to any communication that comes from Pinnacle. It likely will come from their financial advisor, at least that's been my experience so far with clients that I've had that have submitted their forgiveness application. I know that our team that's working on these applications has reached back out to me and has said, hey, Brian, we need you know such and such document from your client. Could you please follow up? But it very likely could come from somebody else within Pinnacle. So to just be aware that uh, once you upload all your information, 
for the forgiveness application. Uh, don't, don't just assume that all is good and, and move on, but be aware that we may reach out to you for additional documentation because uh, it's absolutely our goal too, to help make sure all these applications are complete and thorough so that we can make sure that you also get forgiven on, on these applications. That's a great reminder of that, Brian. Um, another reminder that I think is good, well, not necessarily a reminder, but I guess, Brian, one of the questions, and I don't know if I've seen it out there yet or not, but when you apply for forgiveness, um, it needs to be the primary owner of the company that's signing and certifying that application process. And on the front end, um, it could have been somebody different at the company, say a controller or a bookkeeper, or even an accountant might have applied for the loan itself. Um, so we might have some misinformation in there. So these emails as part of this forgiveness process might be going to a third party other than the owner. And if that's the case, we need to make sure that the owner is aware and the owner actually is involved as part of this forgiveness process. And that may take a little work on our end to get corrected. So you'd want to work, reach out to your local financial advisor here at Pinnacle. They can help you get all of that information completed correctly in the system. So I have seen a few forgiveness applications out there, Brian, that you know, have a, a bookkeeper's name listed or have a, a treasurer of the company listed instead of the actual owner. And SBA has said as far as this application process goes for forgiveness, the actual primary signer or whoever is the primary owner of the business has to be the person that completes the forgiveness applications and signs all of the certifications that are part of the forgiveness application. Yeah, I think that's a good reminder. And I've actually got a note here from one of our previous webinars. It's probably good to remind everybody, too, that if they're self-employed, that in some cases when they go in to search for their application or begin their process, if they use their business tax ID to pull up their forgiveness application and are unsuccessful to then go in and use their personal Social Security number, because I know in a couple of cases with self-employed, uh, the business tax ID search didn't work, but it does work for their personal social security number. So that's just a good reminder as you're beginning the application process and you're self-employed to, to work both of those um, tax ID numbers because you could find your application one of those two places. Um, it looks like Steve's got a question, Lane, um, back to the 24-week period. And his question is that if the money is used in 15 weeks, that he understands the certification of payroll was not reduced over the entire 24 week period. So his question is, does that mean we have to wait until the end of the 24 weeks so that you can make that certification? And I guess our guidance would be that's probably the safest approach. Um, but, but to understand that as it stands right now, that if you are submitting your application before the end of the 24 week period, you are making that certification that you're maintaining headcount and payroll through that entire period, right? That's correct, Brian. There's nothing that says you can't come to us and apply for forgiveness tomorrow, even though it's not the end of your 24 week period. Um, but like you said, you are making um, that certification that you're going to keep that headcount and keep that payroll at the levels in which you reported as part of your application to us. So you would need to make sure that you keep all that documentation. That's not to say that SBA won't come back and ask you for that at some point in time to show them. Um, so I think that's an important reminder to people, Brian, that SBA has said you need to keep all of the documentation from your PPP loan, including the forgiveness information um, for six years. And then we've heard from a couple of attorneys out there that have actually said the statute of limitations on a financial um, loan, such as a PPP loan, is technically 10 years. So even though the SBA says six, it may be a good practice to actually keep this information for 10 years. It's a long think, time. <laughs> yeah, it is a very long time, but it's probably rather be safe than sorry with respect to this for sure. Lane, it looks like we've navigated through most of the really great questions that we've had today. Um, I think it, now would be a great time to remind everybody, again, if you're walking through this process and you, you need some help, first, we direct you to our website, 
pnfp.com slash PPP forgiveness. We've got all of the documents that you'll need available out there. We kind of walk you through the process and try to answer a lot of the general questions that you might have about the process. That's all available there. And then again, Lane was kind enough to do a webinar um, a few weeks ago where she walked you through the entire application process and actually showed you the screens that you'll be seeing and how to take the information from the calculator and move it over into the numerated application and walk you through that. So as you're beginning the process, it would be great to go to the website and review the information, um, but then also maybe go to YouTube, watch PNFP uh, and watch that webinar so that you can get an understanding and get an idea of what you're going to be getting into with that. And then if you've got additional specific questions, we would certainly ask that you would direct those to your financial advisor and maybe loop in your CPA and attorney as you walk through the process, just to make sure you're getting all the best answers and information. Lane, as we wrap up, what else would you offer to our participants today? I just think a quick double check with your financial advisor before you hit submit on your PPP application is probably a good practice um, since we know that the number one reason is missing documentation that we're having to kick out you know, some of the applications we're getting. I think just making sure and validating with your financial advisor that the information you've uploaded is correct and accurate um, before moving it forward to the next step in the process. But we just still ask for patience, Brian, on this. It, it is continuing to change. SBA is supposed to be issuing guidance um, this week on how to handle any businesses going through a change in ownership that have a PPP loan. So that information is supposed to be coming out. They were holding off, I believe, on putting some of that type of information out because they were hoping to have something from Congress on blanket forgiveness, and that didn't happen. So, um, you know, just stay tuned. It still is a changing program, and that's not to say that it won't change even more down the, down the road. And so once the SBA actually gets in there and starts processing some of these forgiveness applications, I'm assuming that's when SBA is going to start sending those notices out to us like they did during the loan process of different things and hiccups they're running into and changes to how the forgiveness process is going to look. And so there just really isn't that rush. I would let some of these applications get through the system with SBA, see what they're actually looking for. Um, if I were sitting in the seat of a small business owner waiting to apply for forgiveness, I'd let some other businesses kind of go through the headache of being the first ones pushed through the SBA a side of the process um, and then come back once the process has been more fine-tuned but um, just start collecting that information keeping that documentation and work closely with your financial advisor to make sure you have it all ready before you apply for forgiveness i think that's very helpful lane um, you know those conversations are going to be important and like we mentioned earlier uh, in the webinar we've received several hundred applications so far and it's very common that they don't have all of the information and so um, again we'd, we'd encourage you to use the checklist and then just maybe do a quick email or a phone call with your financial advisor to make sure we've got everything together and then once you submit that to to stay alert to look for emails to, to look for phone calls from us because we will reach back out um, because as we said we we want to make sure these loans are forgiven as well and want to help people walk through the process uh, effectively. Well, Lane, uh, I know if there's more information back out, we'll probably jump back in and do another webinar, but we're thankful for the time that you've offered us today. Hope you have a great day. Thanks. You as well. Have a great week. Yep. Everybody, thanks for taking some time to, to join us today. Again, we direct you to pnfp.com slash PPP forgiveness and also to our YouTube channel, watch PNFP. For more information and a full library of videos around PPP forgiveness and the application process. And, and again, we encourage you to reach out to us if you've got specific questions about your business. Thanks for making time to be with us today and we wish you well.